One of the more common objections to Christianity is that the deity of Jesus was invented by later Christians long after the first century. No early Christians believed that Jesus was pre-existent, let alone God. It was only until 325 AD did the Council of Nicaea declare Jesus to be God. Of course, there have been more sophisticated objections to the early Christian belief in the divinity of Jesus. For example, biblical scholar James Dunn's view is that, quote, only in the post-Pauline period did a clear understanding of Christ as having pre-existed with God before his ministry on earth emerge, and only in the fourth gospel can we speak of a doctrine of the incarnation. And Bart Ehrman argues that nowhere in the New Testament is Jesus identified as Yahweh, he's only viewed as the son of Yahweh. Here I want to take a look at an underrated passage that you'll want to keep in your apologetic arsenal when you stumble across these kinds of statements. Paul's letter to the Corinthians was written around 53-54 AD, making it one of the earliest Christian documents. In this letter, the apostle makes a rather enigmatic statement about the Israelites in the wilderness, and it probably refers to Christ as having been involved in the nation's earliest history. It reads, quote, For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. That's 1 Corinthians 10.4. This statement seems to be a reference to Christ's real pre-existence, although some interpreters think Paul meant that the rock is just a type of Christ. The latter view, however, doesn't easily fit Paul's statement that the rock was Christ, nor does it fit the Old Testament passages that Paul is alluding to, as you'll see in just a minute, hang with me. A few sentences later, Paul warns the Corinthian Christians, quote, We must not put Christ to the test, as some of them did, and they were destroyed by serpents. Here, Paul says that some of the Israelites in the wilderness put Christ to the test, and he warns the Corinthians not to make the same mistake. Biblical scholars Robert Bowman and Ed Komoszewski point out that although some ancient Greek manuscripts have the reading Lord, the ESV, NIV, New King James, and ET Bibles are probably right here following the reading Christ. Therefore, we should understand and Paul to have been affirming that Christ existed during the time of the Israelites wandering in the wilderness. Furthermore, what Paul says here about Christ is what the Old Testament said about the Lord God, that the Israelites put him to the test. For example, after Israel refused to go in and possess Canaan out of fear of the giants in the land, God spoke to Moses and said, quote, Not one of those who saw my glory and the signs I performed in Egypt and in the wilderness, but who disobeyed me and tested me ten times. That's Numbers 14.22. So here in this early letter to the Corinthians, we see that Paul affirms not only Christ's pre-existence, but also his divine pre-existence. Paul continues his train of thought, writing, quote, Therefore, my dear friends, flee from idolatry. I speak to you, sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? Is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? There is one loaf. We, who are many, are one body, for we all share the one loaf. Consider the people of Israel. Do not those who eat the sacrifices participate in the altar? Do I mean, then, that food sacrificed to an idol is anything? Or that an idol is anything? No, but the sacrifices of pagans are offered to demons, not to God, and I do not want you to be a participant with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too. You cannot have a part in both the Lord's table and the table of demons. Are we trying to arouse the Lord's jealousy? Are we stronger than he? When Paul is referring to the Lord being jealous, he's referring to Jesus Christ. Now, let's turn over to Deuteronomy 32, and I think you'll see that Paul makes some very striking parallels. These parallels have been brought to my attention by Dr. Jonathan McClatchy, and I've linked his article in the description down below if you want more details. In Deuteronomy 32, it reads, But Jeshurun grew fat and kicked. You have grown fat, thick, and sleek. Then he forsook God, who made him, and scorned the rock of his salvation. They made him jealous with strange gods. With abominations, they provoked him to anger. They sacrificed to demons who were not God, to gods whom they have not known, new gods who come lately, whom your fathers did not dread. You neglected the rock who begot you, and forgot the God who gave you birth. The Lord saw this and spurned them because of the provocation of his sons and daughters. Then he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end will be, for they are a perverse generation, sons in whom there is no faithfulness. They made me jealous with what is not God. They have provoked me to anger with their idols. The logic is really straightforward here. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 10.4 identified Christ as the spiritual rock that followed them. Deuteronomy 32 identifies God as the rock of his salvation and the rock who begot Israel. Verse 16 also tells us that the Israelites made God their rock jealous with foreign gods. 1 Corinthians 10.9 and 22 says, We must not put Christ to the test. Are we trying to arouse the Lord's jealousy? Now look again at Deuteronomy 32.17. It says, They sacrificed to demons that were no gods. And 
1 Corinthians 10, 20 through 21 says, No, but I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to be shares in demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord, the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Paul is very obviously alluding to Deuteronomy 32 in 1 Corinthians 10. And Deuteronomy 32 tells us that the rock is Yahweh, the Lord God himself. Notice also that 1 Corinthians 10.3 identifies Christ as the spiritual rock that followed them. This distinguishes the rock from the physical rock from they drank alluded to in Deuteronomy 32.13, which reads, And he made them ride on high places of the land, and he ate the produce of the field, and he suckled them with honey out of the rock and oil out of the flinty rock. The other rock in view throughout the text is the spiritual rock. Unlike the physical flinty rock, the spiritual rock followed the children of Israel. The deity and pre-existence of Jesus Christ is emphatically affirmed in 1 Corinthians 10. In 1 Corinthians 10, Christ was provoked by the idolatry of the people, while in Deuteronomy 32, it was God who was provoked. Paul is admonishing the Corinthians not to fall in the same sin. It seems pretty clear that Paul believes Jesus to be Yahweh, the God of Israel. The skeptic who rejects Jesus' divinity has two options. They could either argue that Christians were simply wrong about Jesus being God, or the other argument is that Christians never truly believed that Jesus was God. Based on this evidence, it seems that the former is a much better option than the latter. People are free to disagree with early Christians about what they believed about Jesus, but there is very little doubt that the early Christians believed it, including Paul. 